The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. AI is a hot topic, and the sector from an investment perspective is also hot. NVIDIA, the company that produces the chips that train and process AI models, its stock has soared from $17 US in January of 2023 to $125 by August 2025. Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, and Meta are all experiencing upsides due to a focus on, and to a large part, hype over AI. Investing in AI on the surface is the same as any other stock, except that it isn't, says Marie Leaf of Odlem Brown. Pure large language models like OpenAI's ChatGPT can only be purchased by you and me by buying Microsoft shares. There's no other option to us. There are also a host of other companies you can buy, such as CrowdStrike, Salesforce, and Amazon. Investing in the magnificent seven tech companies has proven to be sound investments. Lee says that's because those companies have proven track records, proven management, and they have the resources to deliver AI applications and technologies. Investing in companies like AI21, Labs, Cohere, and Anthropic are only available through private placement to highly sophisticated investors with large sources of money, and they are highly speculative. I invited Murray Leith, Chief Investment Officer at Audlin Brown, to join me for a conversation that matters on what you and I need to know if we dare to venture into AI investments. Murray, welcome. Thank you. The world of AI, does it kind of cause you interesting challenges in the sense that uh, how do you describe to investors what to be looking for? Um, well, I, I don't know that you have to describe it to investors. Most people have, um, when uh, OpenAI launched ChatGPT, uh, the world learned about it and played with it, you know, overnight and embraced it and was wowed by it. And so that was, you know, the average person's sort of entry into the fascination with uh, the possibilities of AI and, and these large language models are truly um, impressive in what they can do and uh, in terms of providing answers or insights or history. Um, and, and so I don't think it's, it's, it's not really hard to, to tell people about AI. It's, it's all over the media. Um, I think what gets cheap trickier is is people's desire to participate in it you know just to frame this this year alone the the there's a bloomberg magnificent seven index it's up 45 percent this year 450 percent since uh the end of 2019 just before the pandemic you know the rest of the uh you know the s p 500 without the mag 7 is up about 65 percent over that period so they've really led the market and uh, we've long uh participated in in a few of those magnificent seven stocks because as you said in your intro they're amazing businesses they're very profitable growing fast strong balance sheets and they're investing they're the ones that are investing billions hundreds of billions of dollars in this technology um, nobody yet knows what the killer apps are which is a little different than the internet at the turn of the century. We, we knew how we were gonna leverage the internet with email and search and all those things. And, and how we're really gonna leverage AI is, is still actually on the come. And that's one of the things that uh, maybe gives you a bit of pause and wonders whether or not um, we're out over our skis and there's too much hype because there's huge investments up front and nobody really knows yet when the revenues are going to come. Well, that is the question, isn't it? Uh, what are the advantages of having AI that are going to produce uh, huge revenue uh, returns? Um, are we better off then looking at uh, organizations, let's say like Adobe, which is also investing in AI, but their application is towards programs that they already have. And so does that enrich and embolden a company like that and make them more attractive in the long run? Well, I think um, 
Adobe is a great company. It's not one that we follow and cover right now, but it's one that you know I think our technology analyst Stephen Zickerman has considered at times. It's a it's it's a good, well-run company. Uh, we all use it, um, and there's no doubt that they, alongside a whole bunch of other companies, are going to leverage AI. Um, but that's one of the things to think about. If everybody's going to tap it and utilize it and leverage it, you know, to lower costs or, you know, drive revenues. If everybody's doing it, then can you, the big question is, can you get a competitive edge, a sustainable competitive edge, if these tools are available to everybody? You know, are these large language models going to be free, you know, and part of the Google search? Or are you going to pay for it? Like I subscribe to ChatGPT; it's twenty dollars a month. But you know, Meta offers um, a large language model for free, just as part of their um, social media applications. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. How then does Meta take that enormous investment? Because if we take a look at what it costs to develop uh, an AI application, we're not talking a few computers. We're talking massive amounts yeah. of investment. How do you then start to create a revenue model that makes sense? It's a good question, isn't it? Nobody really knows yet. You know, uh, These big companies are investing in part as a defensive move. You know, If they don't, Maybe somebody's going to come along and, and steal their market uh, with better bells and whistles that leverage AI. So they want to be on the forefront of it. They've got the resources to do it. That's one of the reasons they're very attractive uh, businesses to own, because they have the resources to defend uh, their deep markets. And, uh, and, uh, and they're also well positioned. Um, to be on the offensive, to be there with the investment, with the agility to leverage what killer applications develop. I'm sure there will be. We just don't know what they are yet. So are we better at this point then to be starting to look at the uh, types of uh, products and organizations that are supporting the development of AI? So I mentioned NVIDIA off the top. Um, like. AI can't happen without their chips right at the moment. Are there other companies like NVIDIA that we need to be paying attention to? And I'm not asking you to give stock advice right now, but it's like, where do you turn your attention, especially in a world that's filled with hype? Well, uh, you know, a stock that's treated us very well uh, on the heels actually of a disappointment is, is a company called Vertov. And they make power supply and cooling systems for data centers. And as we went through the pandemic and the aftermath of the inflation, they had contracts with these big data center providers around the world, and they didn't have inflation escalators in their contracts. So rising costs put pressure on their margins. Uh, the stock got crushed. Um, they identified the problem. It was easy to fix, but it took, you know, a year or two before the contracts rolled over and they could get the pricing in there. But if luck had it, uh, ChatGPT came along, the market's fascination with AI and, and understanding that data center growth was going to be enormous, um, Vertov stock took off. And it's been an exceptionally strong performer. It's our best performer in our model portfolio this year. It's up about 70%. It's not quite keeping pace with NVIDIA, but that's uh, nothing to sneeze at. Um, so that's one way to play it. Um, electricity demand. Uh, after you know, a couple of decades of not really growing a whole bunch um, is, is growing again, in large part because of the demand uh, for power from these data centers. So data center electricity demand is about 4% of the total, relatively small, but that slice of the pie is going to double to 8% over the next four years. Um, so, you know, you uh, can... Over the next four years? That's what to they... To 8%? Yes, of the total. So, but data center electricity demand is going to double, in other words. Um, so are you suggesting looking at utilities is an interesting way of being able to uh, capitalize on the fascination and hype around AI? 
Absolutely, and mm -hmm. and you know the utilities were very much out of fashion um, for a long time, but they've caught a bid here. They've been among uh, the stronger performers now this year, um, and 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 that's driven by belief that. Um, demand for their services is going to grow. The grids need to be upgraded and expanded. Um, you know, we're, we're bringing more solar and wind power into this world. Uh, but in a lot of cases, you know, that power is, is away from city centers or urban centers, and it needs to be brought into those areas. And so uh, the transmission lines need to be built out. And these are companies, they're not sexy, you know, they're largely regulated businesses. Um, but if they can pay a four or 5% dividend and grow at, you know, five, six, 7%, you know, that's a total return. Um, you know, around 10% or a bit more better. That's not bad in the world that we live in right now. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. I remember a number of years ago listening to one of your presentations about a company that made railroad ties. Yes. And you said, this is an extraordinary company. And uh, we were watching it closely or that you had uh, gotten behind it. And the reason for it was it was uh, infrastructure uh, replacement on an ongoing basis. They yeah. had sort of capitalized on the market. And as you're explaining this about utilities, I'm realizing there must be a, a whole host of companies that would be along the supply chain side of uh, you know, transmission and uh, uh, gener electricity generation and transmission expansion yeah. that would all be benefiting from this surge in demand from AI, which yeah. is a, an odd way to be looking at, well, here I, here's how I might be able to, to benefit from this. Yeah. And yet we might be looking at the sexy NVIDIA or uh, Meta or something like that. Uh -huh. What we're always looking at is, is, you know, we like to own pieces of businesses because they grow over time. And that both helps preserve and grow wealth. And But there's always a trade-off between the price that you pay for that growth. And sometimes the price of that growth is too high. And so a great company isn't always a great investment if its price is too high. I'm not saying that we're there with the Magnificent Seven, but our attitude towards them after this huge run should be less excited than it was five or 10 years ago when they were considerably cheaper. And just to give you some scope, three of the bag seven, Apple, Microsoft, and Nvidia, have valuations of three trillion or above. Each. Each. You know, Google and Amazon are closer to uh, two trillion. Uh, Meta's a trillion and a bit, and Tesla's a little bit less. In total, it's more than $15 trillion. That is more money than all the stocks that trade on the Japanese stock exchange, the UK, Canada, Germany, France, and Switzerland, than those six big countries. And so that's just kind of mind boggling. When you're that big, can you keep growing at a fast pace? And I think that's something that we need to question. Can they keep growing at the pace that the valuations demand of them. You know, back at the turn of the century, um, in our country, Nortel Networks was the darling. It was a third of the value of our entire stock market. It was worth more than all six Canadian banks and seven of our other very large companies in this country. And I posed the question at the time, would, would you rather own Nortel or these other 13 great businesses? And we all know how that ended, because Nortel ultimately went bankrupt. Right. Uh, and those other businesses went on to do well. And I, I'm not saying it's as dire as um, the, the, the comparison back then, but would they get that big, I think you might want to coach your enthusiasm. You know, the MAG-7 account for more than 30% of the benchmark S&P 500 index. Um, we participate in them. But in our model portfolio, we're closer to 15%, you know, about half the weight in that benchmark. Everybody wants to own the S&P 500 because it's been the best performing, U.S. stocks have been the best performing stocks over the last decade. That was true at the end of 99 as well. Wow. And a Canadian investor that bought the S&P 500 at the end of 99 
lost a third of their money over the next decade. Because when you're on top of the world, the only place to go is down. You know, same thing happened to Canada when we were on top of the world during the commodity boom and the, you know, the boom in China and emerging markets like in, in um, about the time of the, the, the financial crisis in 07, 08, like we were on top of the world, but everybody loved us too much. And I worry that people love the Magnificent Seven too much. We've owned them for a long time. We'll probably own a number of them for, you know, for a lot longer. But I think we need to scale our investment to the risk and reward and consider other areas in the market. So like utilities, renewable power producers, like Brookfield Renewable, you know, we're gonna need a lot of more renewable power. And they're the biggest platform in the world for rolling out more hydro, more solar, more wind. Um, we follow a company named Fluence in the US, uh, which was, um, IPO'd a few years ago, and they're the biggest provider of uh, utility scale storage solutions. Um, and and the world's going to need storage. Right. Because when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow, we need to tap uh, power that's been stored. Well, uh, so I've done some research about this, and you need large scale battery uh, storage capacity that can recharge quite quickly. Uh, and there are some companies that are based in Canada that are moving in that direction, but they're early stage. So what's the uh, advice to investors if they uh, take a look at an early stage company versus one that is, uh, uh, you know, got a longer track record? Where do you sort of sit on saying, okay, I know you want to get in on, on this, this uh, growth, but how do you then determine what's going to be a good company for you to put your money into? Well, our clientele is conservative. Our focus is on later stage, well-developed, large businesses. And my advice is stick to your knitting and what you're good at. There are people that focus on early stage companies and they're good at it. And if you wanna do that, then work with those people, but understand that um, the economics are different. You know, the way, you know, if you're gonna do venture investing, you know, you don't wanna swing for the fences on just one or two investments. You wanna spread it across a number of investments because the odds of success are not great. Maybe only one out of 10 makes it, uh, but the one that makes it is Could huge. Offset all the, any and other offsets loss all the rest. Right. But you gotta be diversified. You gotta expect that you're gonna lose money on a lot of those investments and, 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 and understand the math around that, you know. Yeah. We're looking to, to you know, do really well on, on two out of 10, on seven out of 10, we're just gonna, you know, sort of go with the flow and, and get market type returns and we might have one dog out of 10. Uh, but it's a, it's a different odds, a different uh, composition of a portfolio when you're, you're investing in conservative, more conservatively. So with any investment, but in particular with AI, you really have to understand what your risk tolerance is. I, you know, if people say, you know, you got to take more risk to make more return. I say that's nuanced. Like the price that you pay has a huge influence on the risk. You know, these magnificent seven stocks that collectively are worth more than $15 trillion. Like they're great businesses, They've, they're investing in the future, we should expect them to continue to grow. But you've probably noticed that there's a number of antitrust cases against them now. You know, I don't know whether or not those cases are all bark and no bite, you know, irrespective, it's probably gonna take a long time before we find out. And in, and then in term, I think they defend their turf well, but that might have an influence at some point on sentiment. You know, as amazing as these companies are, you gotta remember that they're economically sensitive too. In 2022, when the central bank started raising interest rates, people started to worry about a recession. We didn't have one, but when people were worrying about it, those MAG-7 stocks went down as a group more than 40% in 2022. And that was they, a lot and, worse than the average stock. And they laid off a lot of people during that time. Too. They laid off some people. That was yeah. more of a story than okay. a substance. <laughs> um, they collectively continued to employ a lot of people. But 
the recession didn't arrive um, or never, you know, arrived. It may still, but it, it didn't. And so the earnings expectations came back, the stocks came back. And as I said, they're up 450% over the last five years or so. Um, but they are sensitive to the economy. So that's something that you have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Our message is be diversified. Don't have all your eggs in one basket. Um, AI is exciting, but I think you want to diversify in, in you know, the renewable um, um, power providers, uh, those that are growing that business. Traditional energy is going to benefit from this, you know. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So moving forward, how big of a role do you think the fascination and growth in the AI sector is going to play uh, in, uh, you know, I guess continued upside in, in the stock, uh, you know, in, in stock markets? I don't know what the future brings. I know that, you know, we own Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and, uh, and, uh, and Google or Al Alphabet, and, yeah. and they're great companies. Some of them are more reasonably priced than the others. We still think they're businesses that are gonna grow, but we don't think it should be a third of our portfolio. Maybe half of, you know, maybe 15%, that's okay. These are great businesses, but we should be diversified in other areas of the market. You know, um, it's human nature to chase what's working best. It's human nature to want less of what's not working. But it's the stuff that's not working today that often is what drives your performance two years, three years down the road. And it's important to have a balance there. If everything in your portfolio is working, you're, I'm certain you're not well diversified. <laughs> so like with everything, use a healthy uh, dose of, uh, of um, I guess, uh, critical thinking and be diversified um, and look for good research. <laughs> well, you, you gotta do something different yeah. to get an edge. If everybody's identified AI as the next great thing and everybody's bid up the stock prices of the, thing, of the companies that they think are gonna benefit from it, then for those stocks to keep doing well, they got to keep delivering beyond the current lofty expectations that everybody has for them. At some point, you know, no, just, you just have to be careful that, you know, the price isn't too high. NVIDIA trades at 50 times the earnings that people expect it's going to earn in a couple of years market trades closer to 20. Like, it's an amazing company. Its margins have gone through the roof. There's a shortage of its chips. So, you know, they're on a light allotment. Their margins have never been higher. The market's assuming that not only is demand going to continue to grow really fast, but they're going to be able to sustain those super fat margins. And they may very well be, but what if they don't? Downside could be huge. And I think you have to appreciate that there is some risk to the downside. So I'd be careful going all in on that. You know, we talked about Vertiv earlier that provides uh, power supply and cooling to these data centers. You know, it trades at 20 times what it's expected to earn in a couple of years versus 50, mm -hmm. you know, and it's growing similarly fast. So I'm more comfortable holding that stock than chasing NVIDIA right now. Mm. Well, a reasoned approach uh, in uh, and not getting caught up in, in too much hype. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Marie. You're welcome. I think I've got a better idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to know. Yeah. Well, if nothing else, the future is, I think, going to be exciting. I think AI is going to do a lot of things for us and businesses that we can't imagine today. Um, and, you know, today's winners um, may be supplanted by companies that we haven't even heard of yet yeah yet to be invented could be well thank you very much